very young, and I saw the first Star Wars movie, I was enamored with the light side. I thought that might be the way I want to go. And as I started to grow up, and I started to become more jaded about the world we lived in, I realized that I had the power to rule. I decided that the dark side was the only side. Who will follow me to the dark side? I will rebuild your world. Your universe will be better than ever if you follow me. on me. I will be your fearless leader. How many of you want to be a dark trooper? Yeah! How many of you want to change the outcome of your lives? Follow me and you will know what the truth is. Bring me the child. And I will squash that little big-eared bastard. He has something that we all need. He has something that we all want. And in the world and universe that we are moving toward, we will all need to have a little piece of that big-eared bastard. <laughs> Follow me, Moff Gideon. Follow me. What do you have to say about that? Yes. <laughs> Dark 
for this reason and this reason only. That's why I'm the man. With the plan. How many people will follow me? Tell me that. Come on. Yeah. Yeah, I'll bring you, I'll bring you to the dark side. I'll bring you truly there. So, Chicago, we love you. And we're so happy to be here tonight. And if I have a panel here next year, I want every single one of you to come. Okay. The excitement and the electricity in this room is absolutely incredible. So, I will take five questions. Five questions from anyone in the room. Who's got a complaint there? Come on. Wow, move to the MCU. I gotta tell you, so being in, in The Mandalorian, if that wasn't enough for me to become a child again uh, and, and to really keep my imagination and curiosity and to revitalize um, this whole Disney universe of Mandalorian, which has been done so well by John Favreau and David Maloney. Graduated for the time being to the MCU, and I am having a blast. Yeah. I'm playing a character that you've never ever seen before. I know many, many people had expected me to be certain characters that they had envisioned me to be in their mind's eye. And for a long time, people were trying to guess who I might be um, in the MCU. Well, I'm Sidewinder, Seth is a guy who never planned on moving to the dark side. A scientist, a great mind, but when you see this movie, you will see me do things that you've never seen me do before. He is a bad man. <laughs> so you're gonna Do you think in your suit, do you think in your suit that you could take Darth Vader? Well, <laughs> I have to consider a little bit. Absolutely without a doubt. <laughs> yes. Out of all the characters you play, what's your favorite one? Huh? Out of all the characters that I've played, what is my favorite one? Gustavo. Well, you know, I don't draw many comparisons, and I have been very, very blessed. I feel like I've had a great career as an actor. I feel like moving into really huge tentpole films, the MCU world, the Mandalorian, Star Wars world, has afforded me time um, and to reflect and to have fun. Part of what I feel about our lives is that we should have fun. It, it shouldn't be that difficult. We shouldn't forget to be children again. And so my favorite roles have been Moff Gideon, stage with the big boys and big girls and to be in a world that is magical in its juxtaposition of light and dark and it's a world that allows us to see what we could be or what sometimes we think we want to be and it empowers us to be who we really are. So I want to invite to the stage the inimitable, the fantastic, the hero of heroes the person we've been waiting for who represents the light, Mark Hamill! Breaking Bad. Gustavo! He was a revelation. I, all I said to my wife is, where is this guy been? You are brilliant. Thank you, sir. Just a brilliant Thank actor. You. I love you. I love what you do. Thank you so Enjoy. much. Enjoy. Thank you. Enjoy. So, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> Thank you. 
uh, I've been pretty busy lately, and uh, I should tell you what I've been doing. I, I'm right now. I'm in uh, Winnipeg. I, I filmed yesterday. Came after we finished shooting. I have to go back. It's a movie called The Long Walk, based on the Stephen King novel. And it's pretty grim stuff. Uh, and I, it's ironic because uh, I first worked with Mike Flanagan in The Fall of the House of Usher. And I said, okay, let's see. I'm playing a soulless, amoral sociopath <laughs> who's also a lawyer. <laughs> Why didn't they think of me? But I'm so grateful to, to Mike because I was a huge fan of his before he contacted me. I loved uh, uh, The Haunting of Hill House, <laughs> The Haunting of Bly Manor. I loved uh, Midnight Mass. And so I really wanted to work with him. When I read it, I thought, I don't know how I'm going to do this part. I, you know, a lot of times you read something and you go, oh, I know exactly who this guy is. That character came to me very late in the game. In other words, I'm flying to Vancouver and I'm still not really sure who this guy is. He's the lawyer for this terrible Usher family. A family where uh, the, the matriarch and patriarch uh, of this company that manufactures this drug that's making them billions of dollars but are, is killing millions of people. So that's, even though it's fantasy, you can relate to that. You say, oh, that's the Sackler family. That's Oxycontin. So it's based, there's a reality that you can accept. And every one of their children is worse than the next. They're all horrible people. <laughs> <laughs> and what a cast. I mean, I, he uses a lot of the same people over and over again. So I was a big fan of all of these people that were in it, called like Caccino and Kate Siegel. And Henry Thomas has been in like eight different uh, Mike Flanagan things. But uh, like I say, I thought, uh, he came so slowly. In other words, I thought, well, hair-wise, I think he's someone that wants to get out of the shower and just do this with a towel, and that's it. So cut it short enough so it just lays down. I don't want it sticking up, but short enough <laughs> so it just barely lays down. So we got the haircut, and then I started looking through the glasses that they had. I found a pair of glasses. I put the glasses on, so I'm getting closer. And a lot of times you have to understand, wardrobe really is a crucial part of, of what I do because they showed me various suits and I tried them on when I finally found the suit and then a hat, very important, found the hat. And eventually, because they have to do a screen, uh, they, they test what you look like on camera, you know, turn to the left, turn to the right, look up, look down, all that stuff. And I was nearly there, and it wasn't until the very first day of shooting, I'm in the office, I'm the family lawyer, like I say, and uh, I'm not exactly sure what the line was, but when I started doing my dialogue, I just started talking like, it'll be there Thursday night, I'll contact you later. Just deadpan, and I wanted to convey like a deadness uh, in his soul, a deadness in his spirit. So I just talked like this, and you know, later in the morning, we we did shot the master. We're going in for coverage, and Mike walked by me, and he, all he said was, "Love the voice." <laughs> <laughs> so I said, "Yes, I'm here." I finally knew who I was doing, but I don't like cutting it that close, believe me. Um, so, uh, what else am I doing? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm the major antagonist in the Spongebob movie. 
yeah. Search for Square Pants is the name of it. Now, I have known Tom Kenny 30 years. He and his wife, Jill Talley, also wonderful talent uh, from Chicago. And uh, we've been, my wife and I have been friends with them for years and years and years. And, and Tom is just a dull, delightful person, aside from being so talented. Uh, and I went in to do my first session, and usually the director's in the booth, right? A glass booth. Uh, in this case, Derek was directing, and he was right in front of me at a table. Tom was two feet away, acting out all the other characters. <laughs> He's so hands-on. Uh, and I, I, they said, well, we need another session when I was in Winnipeg. I said, can't we wait till I get back? Because I really want Tom to be there. They said, no, we really need this. Even though it's not coming out until next year, schedule-wise, we can't wait till mid-September when you're coming back. So I did a Zoom, but Tom was on the Zoom. So I was very good. And I think it went well, because I made both of them laugh. <laughs> I'm playing... Uh, the Flying Dutchman. <laughs> now, when they offered me the part, I didn't know the I'd seen it when the kids were small, but I didn't really stick with it over the years. They're celebrating their 25th anniversary. And so, when I went to do my research, I said, oh, wait, this is a villain that's been on the series a, a long time. Voiced by Brian Doyle Murray, who I don't know personally, but I loved him on Saturday Night Live. Uh, but for whatever reason, uh, they asked me to do it. I mean, uh, that's kind of showbiz, you know? I mean, you, you, you win some, you lose some, you're up, you're down, you're in, you're out. Uh, but I'm having the time of my life. I, we had so much fun doing the recording sessions. Uh, what else? Oh, on September 20th, I think it's a Friday, Anyway, next month, um, I'm a voice in DreamWorks, The Wild Robot. Yeah. And it's based on a Peter Brown uh, children's book. It was a number one bestseller in the New York Times. And uh, I ordered the book as soon as they were interested in, in, in having me involved. And I was just, it's so moving and it's so... Uh, it's just thrilling. I mean, it's it's poignant and it's funny. It's about a this high tech robot that gets shipwrecked on an uh, abandoned island and and has to deal with nature. And I play Thorn the Bear, <laughs> <laughs> and Catherine O'Hara is in it, who I adore from Saturday of uh, Second City Television. You know, the list too long to to do do her justice. But I, for me, SCTV I thought was one of the greatest sketch comedies ever. I still love it. Um, uh, Pedro Pascal is in it. And Lupita Nyong'o is the robot, and uh, Kit Connor, who is wonderful. The whole cast is great. But what I was so thrilled to discover was they showed me footage when I went in to do my first recording, so some of it was was finished, and they kept the look of the book, which was such a relief, because it's beautiful. And uh, it, it struck me as one of those movies that the whole family can enjoy on different levels. Young children will like it, and adults will like it too. Now, I remember taking kids to the kids to movies when they were small, where I was like gritting my teeth and oh, I can't stand this. I would never let on, especially if they enjoyed it, you know, that's the main thing. But this is one that I think uh, covers all the bases. Uh, what else? Oh, <laughs> Mike Flanagan wrote me an email and he said, I'm doing this uh, movie and there's a part in it for you if you're interested. And uh, uh, it's based on a novella by Stephen King. So I'm thinking, wait a second, between 
Mike Flanagan and Stephen King, this has got to be like the, you know, the rip the top of your skull off horror <laughs> of all time. And it's atypical for both of them. It's called The Life of Chuck, and it tells the story of this little boy named Chuck in four different stages. He grows up to be Tom Hiddleston. <laughs> uh, and it goes backwards. It goes Act 3, Act 2, Act 1. And I'm only in Act 1. Spoiler alert. <laughs> but I played Chuck's grandfather. And uh, the basic look was, I said, uh, just take all the color out of my hair, all white. I had a bushy mustache. I get gray in my beard. I don't color my hair, but I don't have a lot of gray in my hair, it's just in my beard. Basically, imagine Geppetto from <laughs> Pinocchio. That's exactly how I look. And, uh, but like I say, it's, it's touching and it's sweet and it's poignant and it's all these things. But I said, between you and Stephen King, you better, your tagline should be the life of Chuck not a horror movie. Because <laughs> you're going to get people's expectations set in the wrong way. Well, maybe it's a good thing. Maybe they go in expecting some gruesome, horrific story and they'll be surprised. So that's going to be, it was done independently, so we don't have a, a distributor yet. But I'm going to the Toronto International Film Festival. They're showing both The Wild Robot which does have a distributor. It's DreamWorks, hello. <laughs> uh, but The Life of Chuck is a very small, modest film, and uh, it'll be... Oh, my dogs are backstage, by the way. <laughs> They'll make an appearance later, I'm sure. <laughs> but um, the, the whole point of showing it in Toronto is to hopefully find a buyer, and I'm very confident it will find one, because it's like, it's unlike anything you've ever seen before. Um, words don't do it justice. Uh, okay, what else? So that's... Uh, let's see the dogs. Uh, I'm losing the audience already. the dogs! That's time. <laughs> oh, there she is. That's Millie. That's Millie. And she does love an audience. Maple's a little more shy dog, which is now she's, yeah, they're all rescues. That's my daughter, Chelsea. And do, you, do you have El Diablo with you? <laughs> Because we brought, we have another dog. Uh, we named her Molly, but after about two weeks, I said, she's not a Molly, she's more of a Trixie. <laughs> and by the way, I had no say. My wife walked into my room. I'm sitting there, you know, reading a book or whatever, and she has the dog in her arms. No phone call. Like, hey, do you think we should get a dog? And I'm not going to say, take it back, you know, so we just accepted it. Uh, is she uh, a handful? One of my least, one of the least uh, favorite attributes of her is just yapping incessantly. If the phone one rings, she barks. No, but small like a chihuahua, smallish, uh, and just you know, I mean, a personal walk by on the street outside, she barks at the person. I love her to death, but, you know, if I could wave a magic wand, that's... <laughs> I think maybe she needs a companion. Maybe she needs a Norton. That's a dated uh, reference, because Trixie and Norton were Ralph and Alice's next-door neighbors on the honeymoon. One of my all-time favorite shows. So I said, maybe she needs a Norton. We'll see. So what else? I mean, you know, it's kind of boring and talking about yourself all the time, believe it or not. Uh, but listen, I have to thank all of you because, I mean, sometimes I'm just overwhelmed at the uh, emotions that I sense when I meet you. Uh, you know, I, 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 I saw a grown man cry today. 
Yep. 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 Any of the movies, you see them as screaming. You don't go with a paying audience and, and, and see them. So uh, sometimes it's, it's quite a surprise to see how uh, the impact that it has on people. Well, I don't know. I mean, I could throw it open to questions, or you could shout out a topic. Jim what? Coach. What's that? Jim Coach. Joker. 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 Okay, here now. Listen, you've probably heard this story before. When I, I, you know, because I used to be much more into comic books than I am now. I read them as a kid. I mean, they, they were forbidden in my house. My father was an authoritarian military officer, Navy guy, and, you know, he said, you know, the, 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 these are for morons that can't read real books. You can sort of get away with a classics illustrated. A Tale of Two Cities? Mm, well, all right. But I had to go to my friend's house to read Batman and Superman and all that stuff. And, but anyway, I was reading this trade magazine, I forget what it was, where they were talking about Batman the Animated Series. Well, I could tell from, from the, the people that they were putting together, I said, hey, this is going to be a notch above Super Friends and the Saturday morning version. They're clearly hiring not only writers that have experience writing comic books. <laughs> Am I getting upstage by the dogs again? <laughs> but I said, this is going to be something special. So I called my agent and I said, I'd really like to get on this uh, series. I had not, I'd done one series when I was a teenager, an animated series, uh, Genie, which was based on I Dream of Genie. But then I did it. It didn't occur to me to pursue voiceover animation. Um, I went to Broadway to try and get character parts I wasn't getting on film when I realized, in retrospect, the greatest uh, avenue for character parts are in animation because they cast with their ears, not with their eyes. And you get to play parts that you never get to play on camera. In fact, uh, I, I, I do dialects, and, but you know, pretty much the only person allowed to do dialects on, on film is Meryl Streep, because they don't really belong. <laughs> and uh, they keep hiring like Australians and English people to play Superman and Batman. I said, do, do we go to your country and, and try and play Sherlock Holmes? Cut that out! <laughs> Hire America! <laughs> But, uh, so they said, okay, you have an audition, uh, and they set the time and date and everything. I have to put it in context. This was within a month or two of Michael Keaton being announced as Batman in the Tim Burton film. And at the time, all the comic book nerds just freaked out. He can't be Batman, he's Mr. Mo! He's a comedy actor without having ever seen him, right? But it was a big backlash. So I only tell this story to put it in context because when, when they said they wanted you to read for the Joker, because I said, I'd rather you know do a villain that's never been done either on the Adam West show, Two-Face, Clayface, Rasha Ghoul. You know, I don't know that I want to try and do something that's been done before. And they said, well, do you want the audition or not? I said, sure, I'll do it. And one thing is, what happens is when you audition for something, sometimes your desire to, to get the part can throw off your timing. Uh, you know, there's a, you can, they sense a neediness or a des slight sense of desperation. I tell young actors, what, even if you as, act like you don't want it, be aloof. Be aloof for the better. As they said in Sweet Cherry. Uh, and 
when I went in, I was following this wave of anti-Michael Keaton. So I thought to myself, well, if they freak out that Mr. Mom is Batman, how are they gonna feel about Luke Skywalker being the Joker? <laughs> <laughs> do you think that's a good idea? Maybe. So I, I knew I couldn't get the part. So I was completely relaxed. I knew I couldn't get it. I went in there thinking, I'm just gonna make them really sorry they can't hire me. <laughs> and I went in, there was one little drawing of him in black and white, that pose where he's standing with his finger in the air, and the only direction was three words, don't think Nicholson. <laughs> well, of course, I'm gonna, you know, the last thing I would do is try and imitate an actor of that greatness. But, um, they had, they had three finished episodes because they changed their mind about the original actor. And uh, I, I, I don't remember much about it. Years later, I said to Andrea Romano, what was it that made you decide to go with me? And they said, oh, well, we heard you laugh. We said, well, that's it. I mean, they looked at <laughs> Paul Dini and Bruce Tim. They said, that's the guy. But like I say, I went in there, I wasn't arrogant or cocky, except in my own mind. Because when I drove out of the parking lot, I thought, ha, ah, good luck finding a better joker than that. <laughs> but, you know, but here's what happens. Here's what happens. As soon as your agent says, they want you, I went, oh no! <laughs> I can't do this. I can't follow Jack Nicholson. I can't follow Cesar Romero. And I couldn't even remember what I had done. Months had gone by before I went for the first recording session. And remember, I had to do the three episodes that were finished before I met the whole cast. Before I met Kevin and Bob Hastings, Commissioner Gordon, all of them. Because in those days, they had everybody in the cast there. If there were 30 characters, There'd be 30 microphones in a row, and you did it just like a radio play, where you started on page one, you read it all the way through once, you got some notes and cuts, they break for about 10 minutes, and you come back in, you start recording on page one, all the way to the end. I mean, it's not so much like that anymore, they like to record you separately, so they can micromanage every syllable. <laughs> and it's at a disadvantage, because like musicians know, you really play off the other people's rhythms and styles. Somebody will say a line where you go, oh, I didn't expect them to say it that way, and then you react to how they deliver the line. Uh, but, so I'm driving in for the first session, and I couldn't remember anything about, did I sound like this? Did I sound like this? How did I sound like How did I laugh? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, of course, in Los Angeles, if you see a single person behind the wheel laughing, it's, it's just another Thursday. And when I got in there, I said to Andrea, I said, I don't remember what I did. I don't think I can do this. I mean, I, I don't know anything. She said, calm down. We have your audition tape. They played it for me. And I went, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, all right, I can do this. But it turned out to be, it was so well written and so much fun to do. My agent, of course, was mad about it. They said, well, you're not the Joker. I said, well, why are you upset about that? Well, we were hoping you'd get Alfred. I said, Alfred? <laughs> the butler? Well, why would you want me to be Alfred? Because he's in way more episodes than, <laughs> than the Joker is. He's in many more episodes. So they were thinking from the standpoint of how many checks I would get. Because obviously, I don't know how many uh, jokers or one in every 15 or something. Uh, but, uh, and, you know, that was the first thing I'd done since I was a teenager. And it was so real well written and, and so many great people. I just assumed, and it, it really, what happens in Hollywood is if you do one thing well, they want you to do the same thing over and over and over again. So I was sort of typecast as a megalomaniacal villain. 
I did Hobgoblin on Spider-Man. Right. Yeah. I did a list of all these, but I was pretty much typed as a villain, which is fine, but I mean, like, I had to be careful not to slip up into the Joker range. I kept Hobgoblin <laughs> deep and more resonant. Um, anyway, uh, uh, when I finally got to work with the entire cast, it was just a joy. And, uh, you know, I just assumed all, all animation is going to be this good. Well, no, not so much. <laughs> but uh, it certainly opened up a career that I didn't have before. And I, for someone that wants to be a character actor, animation defines character actor. Because the idea of a character actor is they disappear into the role and you don't see the face so much as you see the character. Well, animation does that for you. You don't see the face. Uh, and you hear the voice meld into the character, so it's, I thought, what, what a waste of time, because I mean, Genie was like in 72, and I think Batman was 94, but I mean, it was 20 years of lost time. I mean, I didn't even know there were agents that specialized in animation. I got that first, I got both Genie and Batman from my regular theatrical agent. I said, there's animation agents? They said, oh yeah, when well, I got to meet all the people in voiceover, some of the nicest piece of people in show business, because I've done television, movies, Broadway, off-Broadway. I've worked in every kind of situation an actor would work in, and they are so welcoming. I mean, as soon as, I'm sure, later they said, oh, we thought you'd show up in a limousine and have a minder, you know. <laughs> no, 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 you show up on time, do the work, and they accept you within hours. And uh, I just, there's so many wonderful people in voiceover. Uh, <laughs> I remember the first time Arlene Sorkin came in. Now, Joker usually would have henchmen, what we basically call, yeah, boss, parts. <laughs> where he gives out the, and they, they go, yeah, right, boss, right. And one, one episode had a Joker's hench wench. <laughs> and she actually, uh, Arlene was a friend of Paul Dini, who wrote some of my favorite Joker episodes. She comes in. <laughs> I remember this so well. We start reading the episode, and we get to her, and she does a voice that's sort of like, if you've ever seen Judy, Judy Holliday, in uh, that movie with Roger Crawford. What's it? Born Yesterday. Born Yesterday, exactly. She does this voice that's sort of like vacant. She sounds empty-headed, but she's much smarter than she lets on. But anyway, when she came out, I can't do it, but when she said, yeah, boys, or whatever it was, which I fell off the chair. <laughs> so good. Now, I don't have any casting approval, but as soon as we took a break, I went to the producers and I said, you've got to have her back. It's so great. And sure enough, you know, when she came back, now she had a name. Now she was Harley Quinn. <laughs> and the rest is history, because, you know, she wound up getting her own comic book title and you know, it's become one of the more popular female characters, I guess, since Wonder Woman and Lois Lane in the DC universe. And now she's done by Tara Strong. And uh, it's just a great character, great fun and a great con Oh, I see my socks are showing on me. What is it? It's The Simpsons. <laughs> That was a moment when I even called and I said, I have good news and bad news. I said, what's the good news? Because I said, oh, I love The Simpsons more than life itself. They said, they want you on The Simpsons. I said, what's the bad news then? They want you to play yourself. <laughs> uh, I mean, I played myself, I guess, on Big Bang Theory and, uh, and just shoot me. But my point is, it, when you're playing a character, you don't have to take a responsibility for anything you say. <laughs> it's not me, it's the character. When all of a sudden you're playing yourself, you're thinking, 
would I say that? Would I think that? How do I sound? I mean, I don't know. Who am I? I have no idea. Uh, but I said, okay, they should show me, throw me at least a second character, just so I don't just have to play myself. And they, they did. They gave me the Lavelle, the... You are the sorry bunch of recruits I've ever seen. <laughs> that guy. And they later had a character that I thought, I think I influenced that, the, the, uh, the Texan with the hat. Wow. Not played by me, but played by a, a very talented actor, as they all are on The Simpsons. Um, which brings me back to, I don't know what I'm here for. <laughs> Lego Star Wars! When I read Avatar, I, I loved it, and I didn't say this to the people at work, but in my own mind, I said, this thing's going to be five episodes and gone. It's too smart for Cartoon Network. There's no flow. You don't go from Powerpuff Girls to, to that show, and then back to Two Dumb Dogs or whatever it is. <laughs> so I said, I don't think it's going to last. What I didn't realize is that if you write up to children, not down to them, uh, you could not only engage them, but their parents might watch with them. And that's what happened with that show. That's why it got renewed over and over and over again. And I'm frequently wrong. I remember, uh, what was another one? A uh, regular show. I enjoyed it, but I said, it's, it's got a kind of a Beavis and Butthead vibe in that it's about these two losers that are highly critical of everybody else. You know, Mordecai and Rigsby. And I didn't think that one would go. Because I thought, you know, if it were on Adult Swim and they could make pot references and stuff, that's one thing. But this is for kids. Well, eight seasons later, <laughs> I had to tell Dave Wasson, who created it, I said, you know, I had to admit, I, I didn't think it was go, and I told him the very reason I just told you. And they reminded me, I, maybe I should write a book of advice and then people just do the opposite, <laughs> like George Costanza on Seinfeld. Uh, here's an interesting bit of news, I just heard this last week. They want to do 44 more episodes of the regular show. Is that where I'm skips? That's, that's skips, right? Yeah, that one. And William Sawyers, who does uh, Mordecai, DM'd me, you know, saying, they're going to do 40, they're short cartoons, two cartoons make up half an hour. So it's the equivalent of 22 new half hours, but 44 new cartoons. And he DM'd me and said, did you hear the news? He said, I'm just worried, are you in or not? Like, I, I've somehow outgrown them. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I don't do that anymore. I've grown beyond skips. I said, I wrote him back and I said, there's only one skips. <laughs> He's very much looking forward to meeting again with his old pal Rigsby. And he sent me a gift of you know, somebody <laughs> dancing with joy. So we're, we're, we're going to do that. But who knew? I mean, this thing's got to be seven, eight years old. I don't know why. Um, but uh, animation has just been such a gift for me. Uh, I remember doing uh, uh, Time Squad with Rob Paulson. One of the funniest, nicest, most talented people I've ever met. And the pint-sized, hilarious, and foul-mouthed <laughs> Pamela Adlin. <laughs> oh my god, the words I can't even tell you here. And she does it with such, you know, just 
like a little casual conversation with F bombs and oh my god. But she's delightful. I'd wake up in the morning and say, What's what are we doing? Oh, we're doing regular I we're doing Time Squad. I love that show. And what was great about that, because it was very similar, I guess, to uh, uh, Peabody's Improbable History on the old Bullwinkle show. Because the, the plot was they were travelers, space travelers that had to go and make sure that uh, history wasn't altered in any way. To make sure Ben Franklin flew that kite in the lightning storm. So every episode would be a historical figure, and you, you know, as, as silly as it was, it was factually correct. So it, you learned without knowing you were learning, which is the best way to teach kids. And uh, every episode, we had a guest star playing some historical figure, whether it was uh, Nero or, or, or Benjamin Franklin or whoever it was. And every week was some other wonderful voiceover actor that we got to play with, which was great fun. So, where are we? Did Wild Robot, The Life of Chuck. Lego Star Wars! The Boy in the Hair! Talk about Carrie Fisher. Yes. That was devastating. I'm, I'm, I don't know what level you took it up, but I mean, to me, I, I, my wife came into the bedroom. She was up earlier than I do. I was still seeing that tears streaming down her face, saying that Carrie didn't make it. And it, it forever altered, you know, how I reacted to. Star Wars in general, the heart was gone. It was just, I don't talk about it because I don't like reliving it. Mm -hmm. She was so much fun. You always knew you were gonna laugh and have a good time when you were around her. Unless she was manic depressed and then, then you'd flee <laughs> her dressing room. <laughs> she wasn't easy, but she was unlike anyone I'd ever met. Um, I remember we went out to, we decided to have dinner together before we started working on the first one, just to get to know each other a little bit. And within 10 minutes, she's telling me these details about Debbie and Eddie, and so uh, unvarnished. You're thinking, should I be hearing this? <laughs> and details about Eddie's drug addiction, and oh, you don't want to know. Because, I mean, I said, this is the kind of thing you would share with somebody that you've known for 10 years. But she was completely unvarnished and, and, and you know, harrowingly candid. Uh, I remember, you know, after we finished filming, she said, oh, there's a birthday party at my house. Do you want to come? Now see, I was in the middle of seven kids to a military family, moved coast to coast to coast to coast, and finally my father got transferred to Japan, and I went through the last two years of high school at Yokohama High in Japan. And we never, I never knew anyone famous. I didn't even know anybody who knew anyone famous. The next door neighbor was a baggage handler at San Diego Airport, and he told me the story that he returned Jerry Lewis's wallet that had fallen on the tarmac. And I was just mesmerized. <laughs> Jerry Lewis exists <laughs> in real life. I just, I couldn't get my mind around it. He gave you $50? This is in the early 60s. He must be so rich. <laughs> but that was the only encounter I had with celebrity whatsoever. Well, I go over to Harry's birthday party, and first of all, the driveway is filled with Maseratis and all these luxury cars. I go in and pretty much everybody was the son or daughter of somebody famous. Dean Martin's kids were there and you know, you name it. It was, you know, it's like that line from Sweet Charity. This place is so filled with celebrities. I'm the only one here I've never heard of. <laughs> so I thought, 
is a different life. She really is royalty. She's Hollywood royalty. She had a, an upbringing unlike anything I could relate to. Uh, but it just seemed right because I went over to do that movie and we went to North Africa first to do all the Tatooine scenes. So it was me, Sir Alec Guinness, um, uh, Anthony Daniels, and Kenny Baker, and uh, Uncle Owen and Peru, um, Phil Brown, and Sheila Fraser. And we shot there for two and a half weeks or whatever it was. And then we came back to London to start the rest, to, to continue on. And first Harrison came over. Now I met him when, when I did the screen test. Uh, and I knew him from American Graffiti and the conversation, the Francis Ford Coppola film. And, you know, he shows up and he's just, come on, too cool for school, right? And I immediately, I mean, I think George casts people that are so close to what he wants, he doesn't really have to, you know, deeply analyze and get the, he doesn't want to hear backstory and motivation, that's not his thing. He comes alive in the editing room. But like I say, Harrison comes on and I'm just like, instant, I, I, I just idolized him. I think he's so cool, he's so, you know, Devil may care, it doesn't give a heck. <laughs> hey, they don't work blue. <laughs> I've said that before, you know, I say, may the force be with you. Unless you're MAGA, then you can go force yourself. <laughs> Because it sounds dirty, but it's not. And hey, I don't wear blue. Uh, and I, I promise I wouldn't bring up politics. I just, I won't tell you how to vote, but I do hope you're all voting. Uh, it's so simple. Just go to votereiwillvote.com. It's easy to understand. And a lot of times I've heard from people that say, I thought I was registered. But somehow they threw me off the, the roll. So do go to IWillVote.com. And that ends my political portion of the <laughs> show. How long have I been out here? It's 902. When did I come on? 814? Alright. Well, okay. well, I'll talk fast. Lego Star Wars! Yeah. What about George Lucas? Ooh. Oh, well, I was disappointed that he didn't direct. I didn't understand why he wasn't going to direct Empire Strikes Back, and, you know, why wouldn't he do that? But what I didn't realize was he was setting up Lucasfilm. I mean, it was such an unexpected, positive reaction. He went from zero to 11 billion immediately. And we were lucky to have Irv Kirshner. Now that was a director that wanted to talk about that story. He's a real actor's director. Which is open credit because, you know, Empire immediately struck me as deeper, more cerebral. The introduction of Yoda was genius. And you could talk about spiritual things without making people uncomfortable, like they're talking about religion or anything. You could interpret it as deeply or as on a surface level as you wanted. So I was uh, really impressed with the script to that. Uh, uh, and uh, in fact, I remember when I read the third one, I thought, no, no, no. I sort of was thinking the the plot would be. Because Luke, you know, he lost a hand, he has a black glove, he's now dressed in black, and as we all know, villains dress in black, it's a rule. So I kind of thought the third one would be about Luke struggling to decide between the light and the dark, and, and I was reading and thinking, Ewoks? <laughs> and I said to George, what, are you going after the teddy bear market now? <laughs> 
could know, but he always wanted the idea of having this, uh, uh, like a, a really uh, uh, primal, uh, primitive culture going up against the high technology of the empire. You know, they're bringing down the walkers with, you know, vines wrapped around the legs and catapults. It's just an interesting uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, and I saw a movie recently that, that really impressed me because, you know, I love all the alien and predator. I love all that stuff. But I was not expecting, I saw Prey. Have you seen this thing? Yes. Oh my God. P-R-E-Y. I'm saying, you know, because I thought, you know, you, you kind of accept that once you have established whatever the premise is and what the characters are, it's all variations on a theme. By setting it 300 years in the past, where the predator is in this culture that is so primitive, you know, he's got like a wristwatch, he pushes a button and kills 12 people without even aiming. How are these primitive natives going to be able to to take them down? I was riveted, and it's so it's it's uh, so immersive. You really feel like you're living in that culture because they show you how they live, how they make food, how they hunt, all of these things. I wasn't expecting to, to uh, love it as much as I did. And I heard the new. My son saw the new uh, Alien. I said, "No spoilers." <laughs> But he loved it, so I have high hopes for that. Anybody see it yet? <laughs> I'm asking a Comic Con crowd, have you seen it yet? <laughs> first day, first showing. <laughs> that reminds me, I remember the day that Star Wars opened, I, I, the driver came to pick me up because we were dubbing the uh, a 35 millimeter prints because only the 70 millimeter had gone out. It only opened in like 18 theaters. Nowadays they open up in 2500 or whatever. And I said, hey, uh, can you drive by Grommet's Chinese? Because I haven't seen. There was no poster. There were big fights at 25th Century Fox on how to promote it. And George didn't like any of the posters. So, so there was no poster. They just put, you know, uh, stills from the film, you know, lobby cards of different scenes with no poster. But I wanted to see what it looked like on the marquee and he drives me by and I could not believe it because I've been watching for a, an ad on Saturday Night Live or anywhere really on television. I never saw a television ad before it opened. Uh, I never saw an ad except in the trades, you know, in Hollywood and for Variety. But in you know just general uh, periodicals, but I was stunned. There were lines around the block. Day one, first showing, I thought because I thought this thing might take a little while to get off the ground because the hardcore fantasy science fiction lovers will see it day one, and then word of mouth will spread that it's funny. It's it's not like anything you've seen before, quite like anything you've seen before. But I thought it would take a while. I thought, you know, it'll build, but, it, you know, uh, when we were making it, uh, I remember Robert Watts, I, the production manager, had me in his office the very first day. He said, uh, what do you like, what do you, how would you like to be addressed? Would you like to be called Mr. Hamill or... Long. I said, hey, I'm easy, you know, I respond to, hey, you. <laughs> Do you know, to this day, he calls me, hey, you. <laughs> Robert Watts, love him so much, and he's always called me, hey, you. <laughs> and he said, what do you think about this little enterprise we're about to embark upon? And I remember saying, I said, I think we're on a winner. Uh, not many people had an impression. You know, we ask her, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a friend, Jonathan Benier, who worked at the, uh, in the cinema department at the um, Los Angeles uh, uh, Museum, and I said, you should look up the grosses for 
You don't have to go back to silent films. Forget about Metropolis, but for who's sake, keep calm on. Look up the grosses for fantasy films up until the present day. Because he had read the script. I read it the first time. I, I told this story before. I got the part. I hadn't read the script. I just read the scene I was in for the audition. So was, I never forget reading it for the first time. Because when I did the audition, I figured, well, Harrison's a leading man. I must be like his annoying sidekick. <laughs> and, and the title page of the, of the script was The Adventures of Luke Starkiller, as taken from the Journal of the Wills, Saga Number One, The Star Wars. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, I thought I was Luke in the idea. No, it must have been Harrison that was Luke. Oh, I'll just read it and see what my part is. <clears throat> but within you know 20 pages, you realize, oh my God! I mean, this is a high school kid on this desert planet. That's got to be me. Uh, so it seemed through my eyes, which is very unusual. The, the standard way would be to tell it through the eyes of a 35-year-old, you know, scoundrel, pirate, smuggler guy. It just made more sense. Uh, so they already found how offbeat it already was. I also thought that it was effortless feminism to have the princess be far from a shrieking violet. She was like telling Darth Vader off to his face. She was not intimidated by Darth Vader in the slightest. You know, I thought I recognized your foul stench. I mean, wow, pretty mouthy, huh? <laughs> And, and, and when we rescued her, you know, she made chumps out of Luke and Han. You call this a rescue? Give me that gun! <laughs> and she made us look like, you know, the two stooges. I mean, and I thought, that's effortless feminism, because it's not apologetic, it's just showing a woman is as formidable as any man that's on the screen, for sure. <laughs> and I said, uh, so when Robert watched, what do you think? I said, I think we're on a winner. I said, I'll make a prediction. This thing is going to make as much money or more than Planet of the Apes. I meant the original, not the one that was the remake, the one in the late 60s. So I said, if, 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 if at the time, it costs around eight and a half million. So what you do is you double that and add half of that to know what your break-even mark is. So if it costs 10 million after it makes 25 your profit. I said, I, and we signed the contract that if the first one were successful, we do part two and three. So I said, there's no doubt in my mind, we're gonna make all three. Uh, uh, I had no idea the extent, <laughs> uh, but, uh, oh, the girls are back. Is it time? Oh. Oh, they were sitting out to wrap me up. Oh, well. And of course, we love you all. Oh, well. I just, I want to thank you all. If you, I've said this many times. If it weren't for the fans, I wouldn't be here. You have been so loyal and so committed throughout, not just the ones I was in, the, the prequels and the sequels and Rogue One and all the animated shows, Clone Wars, all I mean, listen, this thing, this thing has become, I mean, I was there at the humble beginning. Remember, George called this the most expensive, low-budget movie ever made. <laughs> because every penny had to show up on the screen. The only actors they had to pay real salaries to were Alec Guinness and Peter Cushing, because they were established actors. Uh, we all made it for, I think we all made a thousand a week, is my memory. And uh, I remember complaining to my agent, I said, oh, I'm making 10 grand on primetime TV shows. She said, hey, get a grip. It's George Lucas, it's Sir Alec Guinness, it's a feature film. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the truth of it is, I've never been motivated by money. I've always been motivated by the character and the property. You know, like, I remember watching 
what we do in the shadows. And I said, I would, I would pay to be on that show. <laughs> I had so much fun doing it. But again, I want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart. I can't be more sincere. I love you. You are we love you. the Star Wars family. And you always will be. So thank you for the first you all.